The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Hello, this is Zack Sabre Jr., New Japan Cup winner 2018. And you are listening to Keeping It Strong Style with my mates. Enjoy. Yo, this is Rich Ladder from One Nation Radio. This is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. We present to you the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Let's go. It's the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Covering New Japan, they ready to hold it down. Jeremy Donovan and the young boy Josh. Come and hit a job out in Barrio the Frost. From Tokyo Dome over to the G1. Social Suplex is the network where we can get it done. I'm a chiller. And let them have it Cause this is just an intro Keeping the strong style Six stars from the get go Boy Yeah from Tampa Bay To the Tokyo Dome This is keeping it strong style With your host Jeremy Donovan And the young boy Joshua Smith And thank you for listening Welcome to Keeping It Strong Style, the ace of podcasts on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Jeremy Donovan here with the young boy Josh Smith. On today's show, we'll be reviewing Road to Power Struggle Night 1, answering your questions and covering all this news in the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling. You can support our show by subscribing to the Social Suplex Podcast Network or to Keeping It Strong Style on the podcast app of your choice and leaving a rating and review. You can get all the podcasts and columns over at socialsuplex.com. Check out our Pro Wrestling Tea store, prowrestlingtees.com slash socialsuplex. That's where you can get your official Keeping It Strong Style t-shirt. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider making a one-time or monthly donation by visiting socialsuplex.com slash donate. Click on the donate button under the Keeping It Strong Style logo. This week's episode is brought to you by the NJPW EXT, the only browser extension for NJPWWorld.com with features like dark mode, improved translations and layouts, custom and share, share playlists, synchronized viewing parties, and much, much more. It takes NJPW World to the next level. You can visit NJPWEXT.us today for details. Young boy, how you doing, man? Oh, man, I am doing fantastic. Actually, since we were just on the subject, um, what do you know about the uh, Chrome player that they the new video player? Have you like messed around with that at all? So I have seen there there is a new video player uh, for NJPW World. Um, I, I really don't know much about it. I know it's actually kind of changed some ways that the the extension actually works with it. And I know Danny is working on some some fixes for that. Uh, you know, a lot of times I, I'll use my Xbox as well, the the Xbox kind of browser, and I've had no issues watching uh, New Japan World on my Xbox. And so, yeah, I'm not sure what the deal was with this new browser, this new video player, and why they updated it. Um, yeah, I don't really know the answer to that myself. I know a lot of people seem to be frustrated this past week. Uh, from what I'm gathering, it sounds like, and I'm not the most tech savvy person, but like used to have an app in addition to, you know, an app player in addition to your regular New Japan world. And so you would basically, when you clicked like cast or whatever, it would go over to that app and you'd have like the option to cast. But now they're saying to delete that app and to try and open from the Chrome browser and that there should be an option to cast from there. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure because I've never used Chromecast to watch NJPW World. So, okay, gotcha. Yeah, and you know, I've been I I normally do lately. I've been using a Fire Stick, and there's an app, there's an actual app. Although I gotta tell you, that Fire Stick app is horrendous. It is, I mean, it's great for watching like if you want to watch something that happened two days ago, that's fine because you just open up the app and it's right there. But it, like, if you were to like, let's say, tell me, I want to watch Kenny Omega versus Hiroshi Tanahashi <laughs> <laughs> from the Tokyo Dome, it might take me like fifteen to twenty minutes just to pull it up, literally, because there's no quick and easy way to find matches on that on that thing. Uh, you do the search, the search doesn't actually work that well, and then you try to like go through. If you go through the decades, you try to like do the history. It'll make you go through every single thing like every single thing like it, it's terrible 
man, you would, you would think by now they would just have the your you know your own like NJPW World standalone app that works well across all platforms. Download on your phone, you know your your gaming console, your you know your Fire Stick, and actually be working. Well, you would think by by now somebody would have uh, hired you know <laughs> <laughs> NJPW EXT on to like make most of the fixes that you know the freaking site and app need. But, um, yeah, uh, we will, you know, bring more to you guys as we know about it, but to the best of my understanding, you can play from the video player that is specific to the site in Chrome. You can cast from there somehow. Um, but I have heard a lot of people complaining about the new video player saying it does not work very well. So, yeah, I think it's going to be kind of hit or miss depending on what you're using to stream it on. I know there's just kind of this new like yellow progress bar that kind of stays towards the bottom I, there. I, I've heard – maybe I'm wrong. I've heard that there, there's a way to get that off the screen or maybe they're, they've done an update already to get rid of it. I don't know. Yeah, so let us know, guys. Let us know what you're using and if you're having any issues and we can try and maybe get some word to the right people and try to get some fixes going here. But – uh. We got a road to power struggle night one to talk about this week it happened last Friday on NJPW world to kind of kick off this power struggle tour, the road to power struggle. And it was, it was a pretty good card. Um, yeah, as far as road to shows go, this is probably like one of the better road to shows of the year for sure. Definitely. So let's get right into this thing. So, Card opened up. We had Yu Yamura defeating Yota Suji nine minutes and nine seconds. Kind of seeing, you know, this the, the young lion rivalry continuing here. Yeah, Yu Yamura, you know, fucking up Yota Suji <laughs> over the C over the C Cup. You know, who cares about the C Cup? This 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 is old country beef. It's gonna keep going on and on, and it does not stop. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean that um, Yamura is the, um, the lineal C block champion since he's I, defeated Yota Suji? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, and, uh, Yamura kind of working over Suji's arms in this match. We saw that kind of great arm drag he did in that Gabriel Kidd match during the, the G1, and then eventually getting his uh, double overhook suplex to get the win on his, uh, the bigger Suji. Yeah, I spent the entire match working the arms, as you mentioned. But the the really impressive thing, you know, each guy is kind of adding little wrinkles. We've seen Yota Suji sort of add in a big, uh, you know, uh, big spin prior to him hitting like the, you know, jumping um, Boston Crab. And so Yuya Yamura, he's kind of integrated this new arm drag, but it's – I got to tell you, I've never really seen anyone do an arm drag like this. He's literally, he literally goes like vertical, like completely upside down. Yeah, it, it's awesome. It's a super deep, it's almost kind of like, it looks like he's going for like a, a vertical kind of arm drag. Uh, but yeah, he just gets super deep in there and whips the guy over. It's awesome. Yeah, I I really, I mean, it's super impressive. Um, yeah, I'd like to see that be something he continues to do. I mean, um yeah, it's super impressive. <laughs> I, I can tell you my arm drags don't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so after that, we then had the Empire, Great Ocon and Will Ospreay, defeating the team of Gabriel Kidd and Kazuchika Okada. So obviously we're continuing the story here of Ospreay's turn on Okada, the, the build to the Okada and Great Ocon match that will be happening on November 7th at Power Struggle. Um... You know, I don't know what to say here. As far as, like, anticipation, I guess there's some... I mean, let's face it. Most of these matches are, uh, you know, preview matches for the upcoming Power Struggle show. And so I just don't know how I feel about Okan and Okada. I mean, there there's a part of me that's, like, it's sort of, sort of like the unknown. And from that aspect, there's, like, a curiosity... But as far as anticipation, because I think the match is going to be good or, you know, so far I've been impressed with Ocon. uh, I can't really say that I have been or that I am um, so far. And this didn't really do much to quell that in any way. The one nice thing here, though, was the fact that they had Gabe Kidd included. So 
a lot of speculation as to, you know, the fact he's from England, the fact that he's competed against Ocon, would he be another, you know, addition to the empire? You know, there's a lot of people theorizing that we'd see like some sort of betrayal here, um, which would not be the case, but, uh, definitely an interesting wrinkle to the, the layout of the match. I thought the match was fine. Um, especially the closing section with Gabriel Kidd and great Ocon, but not much here to really get me invested in the Okada Osprey story, or even really the Ocon Okada story, even though we're, we're, we're still early into this thing. Right. And we're, we're starting to see too, like kind of be priest's involvement. We've kind of seen her kind of being a distraction and, you know, in helping out Osprey and Ocon there. And, you know, kind of, kind of like we talked about last week with Ocon and his um, debut match at the uh, G1 Finals. It's just, you know, we, we've seen this guy, the young lion, as as Oka with the awesome suplexes and kind of the way he was wrestling there. And clearly with a different gimmick here, we're not quite getting that presentation that we got as a young lion. And we're getting, you know, more like the Mongolian chops and more of kind of a slower base offense we did see in this match there was a little bit more suplexes a little bit more of it, kind of the power offense but not quite to the level that we saw when he was a young lion <laughs> how are you feeling about his high-pitched screaming i, I don't know how to feel about it, it it's <laughs> it, it's definitely different it, it, it's attention grabbing I, I don't hate it like i used like i used to hate like how osprey and eagles would do like that, that very like loud scream cell they those guys used to do um, but yeah, I, I just don't know how to feel about Okan and the, and the screaming, the Mongolian chops, and the whole uh, you know gimmick that he's doing right now. Yeah, um, I was watching this with my girlfriend. And she was like, "Is that Okada screaming again?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Not Oka this time." Um, but you know, this match was pretty much by the numbers. Like you mentioned, a lot of in- interference from um, B Priestley, but. Um, you know, towards the end of the match, Okada starts getting things in hand when it comes to Okan. Gabriel Kidd gets tagged in. We get your standard, yet always awesome, um, Young Lion tag team finish where he fires up. Tons of, you know, near falls, tons of uh, comebacks, and then ultimately gets cut off and put away by the by the heel team, which is exactly what happened here. So, um Really great. One interesting thing I'm thinking about as far as this team, I don't know how much longer we see Ocon and Osprey teaming up. Um, but if we do, I'm just wondering who will actually be the fall guy here, um, especially in the like immediate sense, because they're really playing up the fact that Ocon was undefeated during his um, excursion. And then obviously Will being the leader of the group needs to you know, to be made to look strong at this point, they don't really have a pin eater. So part of me almost feels like these guys until like Ocon takes a pinfall loss, which we might, we might be seeing shortly, but we might not, they might go on like for a while, not really taking pinfalls, uh, maybe even all the way to like wrestle kingdom. Right. We're going to learn a lot about where Ocon is slotted in the booking of this tour and kind of going forward um, like you mentioned, they're, they're pushing that, undef- that undefeated streak on screen here. And so I, I think this tour is mainly going to be Osprey and Okan versus Okada and uh, Kid or Okada, another young line, this whole tour. So it looks like they're going to keep him strong going into the Okada match. And then obviously the Okada match is going to be the big question mark. Is he going to get that kind of big win over Okada and kind of be pushed as a main event guy? Or are we going to see kind of like almost like a Jay White where they kind of eat that that first big loss on the, on their first big match and then kind of slowly work their way up the card. You want to know a little secret? What's that? All right. For those of you that would like to continue to live in the world of kayfabe, go ahead and hit the 30 second, uh, mark on your, (laughs) on your, uh, whatever podcast, you know, um, you know, platform you're listening to us on hit that about two more times. And, uh, for those of you that would like to live in the real world, Okan not undefeated during his excursion. I went to cage match. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> this man, this man been eating pinfalls. Uh, not a lot, but there's like probably at least three, maybe four, but they were not in rev pro. Mm. So I think rev pro has its own little K fabe, you know? Right. But this man was getting beat. <laughs> Dude. Next thing you, you're going to tell me that will Osprey never, uh, that, 
Marty Skrull always beat well Osprey. You're gonna tell me that Marty, that Osprey never beat him. Mar- I don't know who Marty Skrull is. <laughs> Marty Skrull's dead. <laughs> I went to go look for him on uh, the ROH uh, website, and uh, his profile's not there. So uh, that man is uh, persona non grata, man. <laughs> Man's out. Remember of here. we thought. Remember we thought he was gonna open the forbidden door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 2019 is a crazy year. You mean 2020? Oh, my God. Yeah, so 2020. <laughs> What's wrong with me? I'm tired. Uh, but- All right, so let's move on to this next match. We got uh, Bushi, Hiromu, and Shingo. I think this may be the first time they've all ta- tag teamed together. I'm not sure. Uh, but they defeated the Suzuki-Goon team of El Desperado, Minoru Suzuki, and Yoshinabu Kanemaru, the reigning IWGP junior tag team champions and the reigning... Never open weight champion. Yeah, so obviously, clearly, we're setting up for this uh, Shingo Suzuki rematch that's going to be happening at Proud Struggle for the Never Titles. We've seen, you know, Hiromu the last show um, kind of calling out the champions, and so they're looking to get in their title shot. And this is a very good match, and we've we've said it kind of from day one. You know, a lot of these Lij multi mans are always really good. Especially now you have a guy like Shingo that's inserted to the mix. Uh, you got Shingo, Hiromu, and Bushi in here, just kind of. You're, you're the work rate fast guys here. And so this is kind of a great back and forth matchup here. I'll see a lot of focus on Shingo and Suzuki and they're brawling and kind of getting a little taste of what we're going to see the next time those guys face each other uh, at power struggle. Um, just awesome. The, the death Valley driver spot uh, from Shingo was, was great as always. And um, you know, Suzuki, no selling it and then uh, trying to hit a PK and those guys just kind of throwing bombs at each other. It was great stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, You've got Suzuki and Shingo, two matches this year. Uh, they've increasingly become more and more familiar with one another. Tons of Ultimate matches. And then you've got you know, Bushi and Hiromu and uh, the two Suzuki Goon Juniors. And they're no, you know, they've know, they worked together extensively. Um, so this is kind of something that's been coming to a head and building for a while. Uh, the, the biggest thing here is the Junior Tag Team feud – um, we've kind of talked about how this year there's been like a lack of, you know, junior tag teams within the company, lack of competition. Um, obviously showing yo, uh, when, you know, yo got injured, those titles were kind of put on ice for quite a while. And so this match that's coming up is going to be a rematch of the finals of that, you know, single block round Robin tournament between these two teams. And the big story here, Hiromu is trying desperately to have a belt going into the best of the super juniors. Um, I don't know if anyone's told that man that (laughs) might not be so hot for him. You know, his, his prospects of winning the tournament. If he goes in as a junior tag team champion, I don't know. Right. Yeah. He needs to, you know, do do his history and kind of see what happens there. Uh, But you know, with two nights at the Tokyo dome and a couple road to Tokyo dome shows, I mean, anything's possible. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, but, yeah, this preview match was very good. I mean, it, it was your by-the-numbers LIJ-style match mixed with your by-the-numbers suzuki Goon match. You know, jumping him early on, brawling in the crowd. Uh, you know, the finish with the Satori special and everything like that was very interesting. But the big story of this match is once it was over, um, Shingo and... and Suzuki, they continue to brawl, and then they like pretty much, you know, left, and it sort of just left the junior tag team um, stars, you know, out there on their own. And I didn't see the translation, so I'm not sure exactly what was said. Yeah, I, I, I did. I, I caught the other uh, translations on NJPWWorld.com, and essentially, uh, you know, Hiromu uh, was just you know challenging Desperado and Kanemaru, and he was like, "Yeah, I know we lost, you know, it, it, two times in that league, and maybe that mix not worthy, but." I don't see anybody else coming out here to challenge these titles. Like, do you see anybody? Hmm? Hmm? Anybody coming out? Like, so we'll, we'll challenge for these titles, accept our challenge, please. And so, yeah, that's brought I, Oh, good. No, so, oh, that's brought Accept the challenge. And, you know, kind of like, you know, we're going to show you guys and, you know, yeah, it was interesting that we, uh, only had the first night of the road to tour announced. So it was sort of assumed that some of these other matches might, you know, uh, lead to other title matches down the road. So it does appear we're going to be getting a junior tag team title match, you know, later on here this coming week. But, um, I was doing my best, uh, rich Latta impersonation 
when I watch these guys, uh, you know. <laughs> so uh, I did the translations for Hiromu myself, and then you, I, I, I translated it for everybody. It was really good. That's awesome. Yeah, and another funny thing with, with Suzuki and Shingo kind of brawling, if you watch the uh, the translation, the promos backstage, like their segment, they're at, they continue to brawl like backstage and they're just like fighting each other during the press conference part. That was awesome. And then also Hiromu had some comments and kind of talking about how on this tour, like, there's not an emphasis really on the juniors and, you know, the main power struggle show. There's no juniors on the card and kind of asking Desperado does he not care about, you know, the division and Taiji. Like, he's not really doing anything right now, and he really wants to, you know, get the division back to prominence. Well, they need to get ELP, Rocky Romero, <laughs> <laughs> Robbie Eagles, Ryu Lee. Yeah, there's, there's a whole, whole lot of people that need to kind of bring in here. Yeah, uh, it, it is interesting that the um, junior division is almost so reliant on foreign talent. Uh, not to say there aren't a lot of great, you know, gaijin workers and heavyweights, but it's almost like you, you really see what happens when you can't get, uh, you know, gaijin over for these junior tours. Yeah. So. Uh, the next match, we got Golden Ace uh, teaming up with Tomoaki Honma, defeating the Bullet Club team of Ghetto. Jay White and Kenta. Yeah, so nothing really special here. It's kind of your standard uh, six-man tag. Clearly, we're building up to the briefcase match. Two briefcase matches, actually, with Kota Ibushi defending. Oh, that's not true. One briefcase match, one folder match. There is no briefcase with mm. Kota Ibushi this year. Right. Jay was asking where, where the briefcase is. He wants his briefcase. So, uh, But, you know, Kota Ibushi will be defending his right to challenge for the IWGB title at Wrestle Kingdom against Switchblade Jay White, while Kenta will be defending his right to challenge for the IWGP U.S. title against the ace, Hiroshi Tanahashi. See, I remember... Uh... Remember when RVD won Money in the Bank and then he came out with the custom like RVD like spray painted uh, briefcase? I, yeah. I thought that was like the coolest shit ever. <laughs> <laughs> and like if I was um, if I was New Japan, I would like market the crap out of these like briefcases. I'd get a Bull Club one as like be like spray painted and have like it, oh if Jay won it, you have like switchblade marks all over it. Man, who, who needs briefcases when you can get? Underwear designed oh, yeah. as the tights of wrestlers. Oh yeah, those uh, those Tomohiro Ishii tights are hard. Yeah, that's how you let them know I'm trying to smash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like look. like Ishii said, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, like the way he means it. Right. That's the direct quote in Dallas. That man says <laughs> he he likes to smash when he gets in he the said, ring. <laughs> When he gets he in the ring, he likes to smash. I like to smash. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so, yeah, Tanahashi, he wants the red briefcase. And, you know, Jay White, he wants Kotobushi's G1 spot. Um, hopefully, Ghetto wasn't watching uh, <laughs> well, uh, Hell in a Cell last night because – might give that man some bad ideas taking off a, a title opportunity from a beef briefcase holder. I don't want none of mm. that to happen, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the story here. You know, you got Honma and ghetto, you know, the two pin eaters, and then you got your, your main feuds going on a lot of jaw jacking, a lot of, you know, talking match was pretty good. And, um, I, you know, to be honest, I don't even remember how this, and, oh, yeah, Kotobushi hit Ghetto with uh, Kamagoye, uh, Kamagoye, right? Yep, got the win for the team there. Then uh, post-match, yeah, he had Kenta uh, hammering uh, Tanahashi after the match and leaving him laying on the floor. Then White and Ibushi are jaw-jacking at each other. It's also, you know, building up heat for those two big programs there. Yeah, bro, White was, uh, or Ibushi was so preoccupied with Jay White, he didn't even help his homeboy who got n- knocked out, like concussed. Well, Ibushi, just like, you know, Kenny... Has been trying to tell this man he he's singles now. He's tired of this tag team stuff. So you're, you're on your own, pal. Like we're in a six man, but like we're, we're not golden ace. Like you got to worry about your stuff. I'm gonna worry about my stuff right now. Kenny's so worried about going singles. He should have just stayed in New Japan. He would have been <laughs> IWGP champion again already by now. 
This this Kenny could have been the double champion instead of evil. Ken, Kenny could have Kenny could have headlined Madison Square Garden. Instead, he's working <laughs> Daly's place every week to an empty arena. Oh my god! Hey, hey there's like 500 fans in there, pal. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, had a question here from uh, Badada Bone. He asked, "Looking at the forest instead of just the trees." Ooh, I like that. Very uh. <laughs> philosophical uh do you see abushi being married to the iwgp belt for at least a couple of years perhaps something similar to okada honestly i don't um and, and just because of, of abushi's age um he I, I can definitely see him winning the title but not having this kind of long kind of crazy reign you know he's not the ace of the promotion he's not an up-and-coming young star um, he, he might have a, a decent size title reign, but I don't think there's going to be like this kind of crazy kind of Okada length reign. Well, he didn't say exactly that he would be the ace or that he'd be Okada. He said similar. I'll I'll say that this. Um, I think that this is a question mark that remains to be answered by Kota Ibushi. If they happen to put him in a championship role, which I believe they will actually, personally speaking. If it goes well, then yes, I could see him married to the title in the sense of um, maybe like two title reigns, you know, or maybe in the major title picture. Because if you really think about it, there's a lot of aging stars and there's very few aging stars that are of the same star level caliber that, you know, Abushi is that can go at the level Abushi is. And I think once they decide to go with him, you know, He's gonna be he's gonna be right there. Maybe it's a long term, maybe it's a short term, but I could actually see him getting more title shots after the fact, more title opportunities, because I can't see too many too many other major players at that level that they kind of need to get some juice out of the squeeze with him. Cause like you mentioned, he is older. So, you know, in about three to four years, maybe you don't want to be, you know trying to make something work with, with Ibushi. Maybe Father Time will start to, to catch up. But I think if they're going to do it and really give him some prolonged pushes and you know make some real money with him, now is probably going to be the time to do it. So yeah, I think there's a, I actually think there's a high likelihood that we see him at the top. I'm not saying carrying the company and I'm not saying being the only cha- or you know champion, you know, having – nine, 10 title defenses. I'm not talking about that, but I'm saying four or five month title reigns, multiple title challenges. Maybe he gets a couple title, you know, um, you know, title, you know, uh, reigns. I think that could happen. Yeah, for I, sure. I think he's definitely going to be in that kind of top mix. You know, normally you kind of have like those quote unquote four pillars, or those kind of main guys that are kind of like the, the pillars of your title division and that heavyweight scene. I definitely see him being that. Um, yeah, definitely kind of multiple tile shots. I just, I just don't see the, the big, super long reign. But, hey, it, it could happen just depending on what the plans are, who's there, and kind of even the the you know the whole COVID situation with audience and stuff like that and the drawing ability. So, like you said, it's a big question mark, and we'll see how it all kind of plays out. Well, you do have – you know, you've got Evil and Sonata and, um, you know, Will Ospreay sort of on his, uh, his heels – and then you you've always got to you know consider Shingo, who is also an older guy. But I I think right now, based on the target audience demographics and the history of the company, I think it makes sense to go with Kota Ibushi in a more prominent role over say Shingo probably, or at least for the time being. But um, yeah, I mean I don't see why you don't go. I don't see why you wouldn't pull the trigger with this guy at this point. Um, so yeah, yeah. So then we move on uh, to the uh, okay. the uh, semi main event of the evening. We had the Lij team of Sonata and Tetsuya Naito defeating the Bullet Club team of Dick Togo and Evil. I swear to God, when we got to this match and I was watching it, I was like, "Oh, it's another match." This uh, I gotta watch. <laughs> I was like, "I gotta watch Naito and Evil in a prelim tag team against one another again." Like, whew, I'm over it, bro. <laughs> 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 yeah, there was some interesting backstage comments from Naito. He was like, you guys probably thought to yourselves, Evil and Naito again in a main event? He's like, yes, I thought the same thing too. He's like, I understand if you want to skip my main event. He's like, if you come to the building and you, after, like, you can leave before our main event. <laughs> yeah, he, he told people they could walk out. <laughs> 
this man this man is not putting over his buddy at all on any level like that is the burial of all burials when it comes to a promo yeah oh uh, my god do you remember um do you remember any of the promos when the rock was hollywood and he was feuding with uh hulk hogan do you like do you recall any of those not the promos in specific no bro it's like I've never seen anyone like get on that level like that where top stars get destroyed so bad verbally by someone before. If you ever get a chance, go back and rewatch some of those like Hollywood Rock Hulk Hogan promos. Um, there's this one where like <laughs> Rock is like not there because he's like shooting a movie or whatever, and um, he comes up and he's like, "Hey, hey, there, Hulk!" You know, blah blah. <laughs> and then H- Hulk is like, "I'm gonna." He's like, "I'm gonna cut you off right there, Hulk. I know what you're gonna say." You, you know, you're going to, you know, eat your vitamins and shit some prayers or whatever. You know, you're going to beat my ass. He's like, the Rock ain't got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh like the Rock completely like big leagues him. And then like Hulk Hogan goes to say something again. And then he's like, all right, well, the Rock's going to going to let you go now. And <laughs> just basically like cuts off of the big screen and like Hulk Hogan's just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like just left there with a live mic and a live audience and he's like literally doesn't know what to say like it's incredible yeah i'll have to go back and check that out but uh as far as this match goes i don't know man i i tuned out uh sonata and naito obviously we're never gonna lose um they beat dick togo and evil um interesting thing sonata we gotta talk about him for just a half second here i mean he beat naito he beat Evil. He was in the B Block Finals. Yet these two guys are headlining the next pay per view, and he isn't even on the card. He's like literally like if you think about it, the B Block had worse matches than the A Block. Then the winner of the block went on to do nothing of any sort of note after the tournament was over. It's almost like the B Block literally didn't matter at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like he's just kind of stuck in like no man's land right now. Because I, I honestly, I, I don't know where he goes. I think we have a question about it later, but yeah, I just I just don't know where he goes from here. I mean, like never titles tied up, like even the British titles tied up. You know, with Osprey and Okada, uh, Sonata, you can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, uh, I don't know, man. Yeah, uh, Sonata I, got. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what they're doing with the guy. Uh, he, he's got nothing lined up. Maybe he's going to come into play in this little, you know, LIJ feud. But for the time being, it's hard to really speculate or expect anything. Like, usually, historically speaking, the person who was the runner-up in the G1 gets some sort of, you know, push going into the Tokyo Dome of some sort. You know, some sort of title shot or something. But, um it's not happening here, so I don't know. So far, or at least right now, like nothing's happening. I should say we still got time, but yeah, the Sonata got the win for the team. Got the, the skull end on Togo. Togo tapped immediately. Then post match, Naito got the crucifix on Evil on the floor and was kind of throwing elbows there. And then Moro and Suji had to pull Naito off of Evil. Yeah. And then uh, let's go to our main event because I don't have anything more to say about the, the that feud. Yeah. Um, so we have your never open weight six man tag team champions, uh, the t- team of chaos: Hiroki Goto, Tomohiro Ishii, and Yoshihashi. They successfully defended the titles and defeated the Suzuki Gun team of Doki and the Dangerous Techers. Thirty two minutes and twenty five seconds. 2020 is the year of the never six man open weight tag team titles. 2020 is the year of the headhunter Yoshihashi. 2020 is the year of Doki. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this this match, this was an awesome main event. They did a great job, you know, building to this main event, having Doki Pin Yoshihashi at the G1 Finals and those guys that started the match. And that was kind of a, a big part of the story here. Obviously, Yoshihashi looking for revenge um, and trying to, you know, get the revenge and pin Doki. 
Um, you had Ishii in there, also with the taped up knee. He had a, he was a target there for dangerous techers, kind of doing that dragon screw combo. There's a lot of focus there um, on the knee. Um, and obviously, it's Tai Chi and Saber, they're the current you know heavyweight tag champs, and so obviously trying to avoid any pinfall uh, situations there. Uh, but yeah, it's a great hard hitting back and forth, fast pace. Um, Doki, like we, we've talked about, a guy that a lot of people you know crapped on when he initially came into the promotion and didn't really give him a chance. And um, slowly by slowly, every opportunity he gets has been really impressive. And you know, kind of you know, one of the highlights here, him and Yoshihashi were the, were the highlights here in this matchup. Yeah. Speaking of what you mentioned earlier, the never open weight six man tag team championships. So, I mean, you know, we started the year with Taguchi, Togi Makabe, and Toriano, sort of just like a comedy tag team. They lost those belts at um, Wrestle Kingdom in the in, a, in the dark match that was, you know, the gauntlet to Bushi, Evil, and Shingo. And ever since those guys won the belts, uh, the titles have just been really like invigorated. Um, Bushi, Evil, Evil, and Shingo went on to have like this crazy, uh, series of matches, uh, with the chaos guys. I think it was like Robbie Eagles, Ishii and Goto. They had a two match series that were both like, at the time we were like, wow, those matches are like blow away. Then after the evil turn and the vac, you know, you know, the titles, uh, were vacated, Goto, Ishii and Yoshihashi elevated the titles even higher um, that tournament produced quite a few really great matches. The one specifically, well, there was two specifically, um, the semifinal match with this chaos team against the Hontai team of golden ACE and Wato was awesome. And then the next night, the chaos versus chaos six man tag team match where this team was awarded the titles. That was like one of the best tag team matches of the year. They had a rematch and it was awesome. And now this match and this match is awesome. So that's like five, probably literally the five, like I could be wrong here, but I'm going to guess that these five matches are already literally the best never six man open weight tag team tag like matches ever. <laughs> <laughs> and they all happened in the same year. So it's just kind of crazy. Um, as far as like Yoshihashi and Doki go, we've always known that both those guys are, are great wrestlers. Um, you know, say what you will as far as, you know, and I've had my own like judgments and misgivings about both guys at different times and rightfully so. But the question has never been, could they, you know, go in the ring when need, you know, when needed or when called upon, that's never really been in question, but yeah, it's like a convergence of so many things, like the never titles being raised in prominence have, you know, I would say I would literally put these never open weight six man tag team titles match for match against both the junior and the heavyweight IWGP tag team championships this year. Yeah, I think I might take the six mans over the juniors this year for sure. Yeah, and year, I would yeah. probably take them over the heavyweights, too, if I'm being honest. I mean, yes, dangerous techers and and. uh Golden Ace had like a, an awesome two match series, but I mean, what else did we have this year? You know, the GODs matches, I, I wasn't so high on those. The Finjuice matches, I wasn't so high on those. Like, I think this title is the best tag title in New Japan right now. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. I, I never want Goto, Ishii, and Yoshihashi to lose these things. <laughs> these guys are an awesome unit. You know, you got this fired up, motivated Yoshihashi, so happy to finally have a title, takes pride in this, you know, this six man title division. And, I don't know what got into him this year, but he's just been on another level, especially, you know, in the G1, having, you know, one of the standouts in the B block, came very close to being the MVP of the B block. Uh, and then once again here, just, you know, showing the fire and almost more of a strong style um, kind of flair to his, his wrestling here. And uh, just a lot of fire and emotion behind him. Yeah, this match, one thing, well, a couple things, you know, we got award seasons coming up. Um you know, we're not ready to unveil everything, but I can tell you that this is going to be an award candidate of some sort for sure. That's how good the match is. Um, tai Chi and Zack Saber, I think that they've shorn up their, you know, candidacy as being a tag team of the year candidate even further, you know, with this match. And 
you know, Goto Ishii and Yoshihashi have locked up their candidacy as being a candidate for tag team of the year as well. So, <laughs> um, the one thing I was sitting there, the more that as I'm learning about wrestling from an insider perspective, there's, there's a lot of things that I haven't always paid a lot of mind to, or, you know, a lot of details and there's certain things I'll notice now. One of the things I just noticed and thought about was like for 32 minutes, 25 seconds, these guys put on one of the most seamless transitioned tag matches like I've ever seen. And, you know, very often wrestling matches have a very basic formula. You know, you've got your early part, the shine, the heat, you know, the cut off the heat and then the comeback and then you go home. And in New Japan, they play with that, you know, uh, formula a little bit, and they like to do a lot of the prolonged, like, all the baby faces are going to beat up. They're going to get their sort of like, you know, they'll do a, 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 an additional shine or additional heat segment um, in the middle of tag matches, and they like to do like the thing where guys in the corner and the whole team like keeps beating them up or hits a bunch of things, and then. You know, towards the end of the match, they like to do the thing where everybody comes in and hits their signatures. And they definitely did some of that in this match. I'm not saying that. But one thing that they did was just like reversal, counter. One guy gets thrown out, another guy comes in. It was closer. This, the pace and style of this match reminded me a lot more of like when I watched Lucha or like an old Michinoku Pro uh, tag team style match. Like, I just was like, who freaking booked this match how did they remember all these sequences and segments and who was gonna do what and beware and the timing like it was so freaking crisp um yeah there, there, was, a, there was a great uh triple down spot where uh oh, Do- yeah. doki hits a suplex de luna then gojo comes in and saves yoshihashi he hits doki with the gtw then taichi takes goto out ishi comes in lariat's taichi saber comes in uh hits taichi with a pk or hits ishi with a pk and then all six guys are down that was awesome now here's the thing they always do that in every single new japan tag match what was impressive here was when and how they chose to do it because like I mentioned, they do it in almost every single multi-man match, especially when they try to make it feel epic. But the the delivery of it isn't always so epic. But this one was like really late into a really long match that was already at a super high pace and level. And every guy sold it perfectly. The crowd ate it up like uh, it is just it was beautiful. And the craziest thing is like. One of my favorite things about the match was the prolonged period where they let Doki and Yoshihashi, who were the two principal, you know, people that the match was built around, just work in the ring for a long period of time. I even noticed um I think they messed it up, but like Doki, he had this mess shirt on and I noticed this like stuff written on his back. Maybe I I, I don't want to say it's kanji if it's not kanji, but that's what I thought it was like a kanji symbol or something. And I was like, does he have like a terrible like back tattoo that I never knew about? Because it was huge. And I was like, oh, my God, that's why they always make him wear a T-shirt is because <laughs> he's got terrible. <laughs> but then later in the match, he took his shirt off and there was nothing on his back, just a bunch of like black smeared crap. And I was like, oh, he had something written there. But they worked so hard <laughs> 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 that whatever was painted back there it like got completely all smeared. came yeah. off. Yeah, but these guys, these guys worked so hard, bro. It was incredible. Yeah, you, you got Doki, you know, doing the kind of the big senton spot to the outside. He's been pretty much doing that in a lot of his matches, and uh, that's always an awesome spot there. And yeah, this was just just awesome stuff here. And you know, obviously, it came down to um, Doki and Yoshihashi at the very end, and Yoshihashi was able to uh, get Doki up for the karma and to get the big win here. Yeah, and that was great too because they teased him not being able to get it on like two or three different occasions. So they threw in a mix of, you know, one of the things New Japan's so great at is having the best finishing sequences in wrestling. We've always said that. And you don't always see it in tag matches, but they they really had that here. Just like so many near submissions, so many near falls, so many like – uh you know, just teasing of finishers and reversals at the end. This was really epic. Uh, I was convinced 
that the match where Yoshihashi won his first title against Okada's team, that that would be like, you know, the premier, like never open weight six man tag team match. I think this is the one like, this was incredible. Um, I, I was blown away, man. Um, I don't know, four and a half. Yeah. I think, I think I'm like four and a quarter, four and a half in the, in that range. I could, I'm close to going higher. It's what it's right now. It's one of the highest rated tag team matches of the year in general in anywhere in the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's just awesome. Awesome matchup. Even like there's a great spot with Doki and Yoshihashi where Yoshihashi, um, you know, rolls through on a DDT. He locks in the butterfly locks, but he quickly transitions into a Kimura, then transitions into a sleeper. Then Doki kind of reverses with these kind of two like quick cradle near falls, and it's just just yes. awesome, awesome stuff. We had some questions here. Peace in ninety one asks us, "What is going on with twenty twenty that we're getting excellent never six, six man matches, and the most recent match highlighting Yoshihashi and Doki? Is it just me, or have the majority of the never six man matches, bar the one at night two of Wrestle Kingdom, been some of the most enjoyable matches of the year? Also." I think after the m- most recent Corkin match, I'm going to have to jump on the Doki bandwagon. I hope he gets in the best Super Juniors, and he's uh, has some surprisingly great performances, like in that Never Six Man match. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's, it's just like what we talked about. We we went. Is, we, is are they surprisingly great matches at this point? Uh, I don't think so. Can, can we stop saying surprisingly? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the thing, it's the Never Six Man titles. I don't really think it's so much the guys. But when you think about the Never Six Man titles, it's there's something that's kind of hot potatoed. They aren't always the best matches. They normally do, you know, main event a road to show like this. And, and they're fine. Nobody's, like, raving about them. Nobody, you're not hearing great reviews. But we're seeing with these Never Six Man titles. We're, we're getting great matches. Yeah, it main evented a road to show, but it was awesome. You're seeing on cage match. You're seeing nines on grapples. You're seeing, you know, Four and a quarter, four and a half. Everybody that watches, like, you know, go out of your way to watch this matchup. This is what we begged the tag team titles to be this year, and they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, man, you, you echoed a lot of the same sentiments that we had earlier during our comments. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to overhype Doki and Yoshihashi, you know, and say they're, they're the greatest things since sliced bread. But uh, we need to praise them for the amount, you know, for for the excellent performances that they've had, that they had. And um, I think we should stop saying surprisingly great performances from the two guys if they keep consistently, you know, putting out bangers like that, you know, at some point. And this here and here's the hope, you know, you see a guy have a great match and you're like, man, that was great. That was I was surprised. And you hope at some point they get to to that placement in their career where you stop saying I was surprised, and right. you just say that was great. <laughs> They're great, which right. is uh, you know, I don't know, man. I think we are definitely looking at two of the most improved wrestlers in New Japan, maybe the two most improved wrestlers in New Japan in 2020, in Doki and uh, Yoshihashi, and this match really showcased that. Yeah, then we had a question here from Reddit user Ginger Ninja six 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 says, "Is Doki the ultimate proof that some people really do conflate a wrestler's abilities with their spot in the company? Because I swear I don't remember Doki ever being bad, and yet people are always surprised when he has a good match." Yes, I think that is absolutely the case. I think that there are one hundred percent biases against wrestlers based on where their spot in the company is based on what their perception of their character is and the perception of the performances that they've had in the past. Um, keep in mind, and not everybody likes to hear this and there's people who will probably judge me, but even if you don't like this, this is the reality of the wrestling business. Even if you disagree with it, there are people who are told to go out there and to not look great themselves, but just to make other people look great. We call them jobbers. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And there's some people who are like, man, why has this guy been around for all these years? They're, they suck. You know? But if they're in this company, they probably don't suck. You know? They might not be Okada level, but they probably don't suck. They probably have a certain particular role. And for a while, Doki had a role. 
for a while, you know, Yoshihashi had a role. And I, I think the problem with Yoshihashi was they gave him a lot of opportunities and he kind of, you know, crapped the bed. But with Doki, I, I haven't seen him really miss too many of his opportunities. The only times that I think his reputation, aside from the fact that his look isn't the greatest and his gimmick isn't the most appealing, his early matches in his first Super Juniors, which was on a short notice, there was definitely a steep learning curve for him to acclimate into this style of wrestling. Right. But I feel like once he acclimated, the guy has done nothing but deliver every time he goes out there. He makes people look like a million bucks, and he shines when he's asked to shine. Right, and that's a great point I was going to bring up that you made there. You know, he came in for best of the Super Juniors last minute. You know, you had Flip Gordon and a couple other people that couldn't make it in the tournament for, for various reasons, and uh, and Chris Sabin, another guy. And so, yeah, Doki being one of those replacements last minute, you know, a guy who was kind of wrestling on the, you know, the grimy, you know, Mexican indie scene, J- Japanese indie scene, and just kind of coming in and taking a spot in a, a big tournament where people are expecting, you know, great performances, you know, great, you know, four and a half matches every night. And uh, he just wasn't, you know, doing that, like you mentioned, kind of getting used to that, that New Japan style. And, and you know now like he's he's acclimated and he's having great matches and and kind of like P. San was saying yeah I'm looking forward to seeing Doki in the best Super Juniors this year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know while we're on the topic and I'll just bring this up real quick. This is just something that I've experienced in my, in my life. You know, so for for a good while I was doing you know lots of different martial arts training. You know, jujitsu, wrestling, judo, stuff like that. You know. Lots of MMA based training. And then I would go watch fights and I'd go to these like, you know, sports bars and I'd hear people, you know, you'd hear like these idiots who don't know anything about fighting. <laughs> you know, you show, especially at the big fights, you know, a McGregor fight, you know, a GSP fight or a Brock Lesnar fight. And they would say really stupid stuff. And the more that you would, that I would train and learn and understand about the craft and the sport the more I would realize how bad I was at it or how much like a, an actual pro fighter might like murder the average human being right? (laughs) and how the general populace doesn't know what they're talking about. One thing I can assure you guys of, there are times where it might seem like there's a lot of magic in wrestling that is missing because the curtain's been peeled back for so long and kayfabe has been killed and everything's so insidery and the rise of the smart mark. The more that I have learned about the actual in, ins and outs of professional wrestling, and, I, and I'm just, you know, in the infant stage, the more I realize that, like, I sit back and I think about things I've said um, to my friends over the years on podcasts, and I cringe. <laughs> <laughs> because you, there is a lot of magic that still exists that people just don't know. You know, um, and it's sort of and this is a great point. You know, you talk about a guy like Doki or a guy like Yoshihashi and people. Ha- everyone's entitled to their opinion and whatever um, entertains you, entertains you. And, you know, we come on this show and we hope to be experts and we hope you guys find enjoyment out of it. And we definitely are <laughs> to some extent. But at the same time, there is a lot that you just will never know. <laughs> <laughs> and um Every you know, I hear people say things where they think that they know pro wrestling, but it's like you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Like the more I watch people that um, people think suck, like for instance, Ujuro. And now I'm not a Ujuro fan. I'm not a mark for the guy. I don't love his matches. But the more I watch him, the more I realize he is actually very, very talented. And very, very good. Um, Why are his matches so bad? I couldn't tell you. (laughs) (laughs) Part of me thinks that maybe he is being asked to do those things. Or maybe he's not as – maybe he's doing what he's good at. Maybe he's not – You know, maybe he couldn't go out there and have an Okada-esque match. But the things that he does do, he's very good at them. Um, So, yeah, that's just my little rant. Like – the more that I'm watching this the, and the more I'm learning about, about this, the more I'm realizing that there's a lot of like 
don't ever get disenfranchised with this thing and think like we've all got it figured out because we don't. And they're going to, you know, this thing's just going to keep going. Yeah, and, that, and that's going to wrap up the, the Power Struggle Night 1. At the end of the night, we did have Yoshihashi uh, challenging the Dangerous Techers for the IWGP Tag Team titles. Um, and then uh, post-match, Goto volunteered himself to be Yoshihashi's uh, tag team partner. And they tagged together during the Tag League last year. Is that correct? Uh, you're asking me to remember Tag League stuff. <laughs> um, I... I, I I feel like, I mean, aren't they usually World Tag League uh, guys together? Um, I think and, they and are. And usually it's Yano and Ishii. Ishii. Yeah, yeah. But what? But last year Yano would have been with Colt Cabana. Colt Cabana. So let, let let me look back real real quick. So Ishii was with Yoshihashi. Okay. Okay. So that kind of ruins it a little bit, but. With that being the case, uh, Yoshihashi and Hiroki Goto have a long history of tagging together in World Tag Leagues and, you know, outside of it as well. So, um, you know, we've actually seen them have quite a few really great matches as a tag team tandem. And Dangerous Techers are one of the amongst the best tag teams, you know, in the world right now. So that match should be awesome, too. Yeah. And so we'll get into right now a preview was coming up on the remainder of the road to power struggle. So we have two shows coming up on November 1st on Sunday and then November 2nd on Monday. Um, some very similar cards here. So on November 1st, we'll have Yota Suji taking on Yu Yomura. There will be a six man tag with Yano, Yoshihashi, Hiroki Goto against Doki and Dangerous Techers. We have a rematch of uh, Gabriel Kidd and Okada versus the Empire. There will be Hanuma and Golden Ace against a returning Chase Owens. That's right, Chase Owens is back in Japan. So Owens, Kenta, and Jay White. Chase Owens, you say, hmm? <laughs> 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 um, and then the semi-main will have uh, the rematch. Uh, well, actually a little bit different here. We have Sonata and Naito against Yujiro this time. Yujiro and Evil. And then in the main event this evening, we'll have the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team titles on the line as Bushi and Hiromu look to win the titles for the very first time together, challenging against Katamaru and El Esperado in their first defense since having the titles. Well, since um, I, I honestly don't even care to give predictions uh, for the first five matches of this thing, um, unless the, like, unless you think there's some sort of crazy angle, <laughs> it's more of the same. It feels like, right. um, it's, it still looks like a pretty good card, but I think what people really are wondering is what are we thinking when it comes to this junior tag team title match? Yeah. I mean, there's the, obviously there's two ways it can go, but as far as story wise is, Oh, you, there's two ways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, story wise, also you, you could have Desperado and Kanemaru retain and also the whole story there being like those guys just have. Bushi and Hiromu's number. They just can't beat those guys and kind of keep that kind of the ongoing story between those guys. And eventually you build up to a big moment down the line once Hiromu and Bushi finally beat those guys. And then, you know, maybe Hiromu's a guy you don't want walking into Best Super Juniors with a junior tag team title. Or you can go like kind of the, the feel good route and have, you know, Bushi and Hiromu finally kind of, you know, beat these guys in, in the main event and win the titles for the first time together. It's something that they've said they've always wanted to do. And that, you know, just kind of helps solidify, you know, Hiromu's resume as, you know, one of the best juniors um, in New Japan. Um, so those are kind of the two uh, kind of big angles and also the two directions that can go. Um, as far as which one I think they're going to do, um, I don't know. I'm leaning more towards Bushi and Hiromu winning. You know, these guys just lost back-to-back -back nights to these guys in that little junior league they had, uh, I just feel like it'd be uh, it'd be better for Hiromu and Bushi to get the win, even though you might have both those guys going into the league with the titles. Yeah, you did a great job, you know, giving us the summary there. Um, you know, Bushi and Hiromu, like you mentioned, they've never won these tag team titles together. Hiromu has never held the junior tag team titles. The one accolade within what you would probably – call like the junior triple crown in new japan you know you've got the uh junior title the junior tag team title and then the uh best super juniors 
And if you want to throw a J cup in there, you know, uh, you can, but it's, that's only so often. Um, but this is the one thing he's never done out of those three. And I've there, there, we've actually had people write in and speculate that he will never hold the tag title the same way that Okada, you know, is almost Hulk Hogan esque, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Hulk Hogan never held that IC or that tag belt. He, he could only be the, the main draw, the main title champion holder, you know, brother, um, Okada's kind of that way. And there's people who've speculated that's the way Hiromu is going to be treated within this, uh, division. I don't know that that's the case, but I mean, Bushi and Hiromu lost back to back during the, the round Robin tournament to crown a new champion. Uh, they lost both in the finals and on the, uh, you know, the night leading up to the finals, Bushi took a fall. Hiromu took a fall. So they definitely have revenge on their minds. And it is interesting to see how it's going to play out going into the super juniors. Um, I think I'm going to predict Suzuki Gun winning just because from a personal standpoint, I would like to see Hiromu go into the, uh, juniors with maybe a chip on his shoulder, maybe something to prove and maybe a little bit of a feud, especially with Desperado. Um, but you're probably right. I mean, Bushi and Hiromu could definitely win this. I, I don't really have a, because this title is so hot potatoed and so unimportant to me at this point, you know, at, in 2020, it doesn't really matter to me who wins it all that, re- especially since there's also no, <laughs> there's no junior division <laughs> right. uh, to speak of. So it's like, who's next on the horizon? You know, I, I Tiger mask. I don't know. Right. No. Backside Jerome was like, why doesn't anybody want these belts? Why isn't anybody else come out the challenge? I'm like, Romo, there, there is nobody else. That's why. <laughs> Marty and Flip, I don't know. <laughs> I like that Marty was dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he is, and Flip's like canceled. So yeah, so. Uh, they don't they don't care about that stuff in Japan. Bring him. Wow. But uh, yeah, man, I don't know. I, I'm gonna go Suzuki Goon, but I, I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong because I don't really care. <laughs> but the what I am excited about is the implications of what this will mean for best of Super Juniors. And the other thing I'm excited for is the match itself should be very good. Um, I wasn't super thrilled with the last two matches that they had. I thought they'd be better. But we've seen these two teams uh, work together quite a bit in the past and have really good matches. And coming off the heels of the tag team match that we just saw, they've got big shoes to fill. Yeah. So that takes us to the uh, next night here, November 2nd. We got Yota Suji versus Gabriel Kidd. We got Yu Yamura. We have Yu Yamura, Kazuchika Okada versus The Empire. We have Bushi, Hiromu Takahashi, and Shingo Tatagi versus Yoshinobu Kanemaru, El Esperado, and Minoru Suzuki. Then after that, we will have the entrance for the best of the Super Junior 27 to be announced. And we have a ton of questions uh, around, revolving around this and pretty much most of the same. So uh, first one, Rambo and Slam Picks. It's much like how people have... Lost a limb sometimes, wake up scratching at the leg, there's no longer there. I find myself longing for another high-quality tournament after conclusion (laughs) of the G1. What is your speculation about the size of the field for Best of Super Juniors? Any surprises for entrance, and who might be an early favorite to take the prize? Then from a user, if I can be serious, he says, Best of Super Juniors slash World Tag League lineup predictions. Uh, EMJ does PR in the Discord, expecting any surprises for Best of Super Juniors slash World Tag League. And then Josh, number two, co-host of the 8-Bit Suplex, says, who, if any, are some of the tag teams from outside of Japan that the C Drew brought into a World Tag League or Juniors for the Super Juniors? So, Josh, the people want to know, who, what are we thinking here for best of Super Junior lineup, World Tag League, who we think's coming in, field size, surprises, what are you thinking, man? Well, um, if history proves to be true, we will do a show a few weeks out from the tag league where we speculate wildly about all sorts of teams that could and would be cool if they brought in. And then none of those teams will come in and we will get a bunch of mishmash teams thrown together, just using the people that are in new Japan, which for the most part usually turns out to be fine. Um, you know, the last couple tournaments have been pretty good. Uh, 
I mean, we don't like praise them for the rest of the year. We kind of, it's like they happen. We say they're pretty good. And then Wrestle Kingdom shows up and we forget that shit. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I don't even know if they're going to bring any teams from outside. Um, at this point, like the teams that could be coming in from the outside that I might be expecting would be like God, you know? Right. Especially, you know, we're seeing them bring in more of the, the, the strong guys, obviously, you know, Cobb and Kenta and Jay White were guys that they brought back for G1 and they're bringing Chase Owens back for this tour. So I could easily see them, uh, you know, bringing back a, a God uh, for the world tag league. I know there's a lot of people speculating on the Good Brothers, uh, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. They did fail to win the Impact Tag Team titles this weekend at Bound for Glory. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about them, you know, planning to work for New Japan. Um, So there's a lot of people who are thinking that's a team that could be brought in. Um, Yeah, besides that, I really don't know who who you really try to bring in here. You know, also, you're going to work with people you know. I don't, I don't think they're taking a lot of chances, a lot of unknowns or trying to bring in like new teams, especially from the U S at least. Yeah. I mean, in the past, um, you know, they've tried to bring in teams from like, you know, maybe not even teams, maybe even just like individuals from like CMLL or ring of honor, um, or, you know, rev pro, some of their like sister partnership, uh, promotions, but for the most part, they pre- they don't generally usually do any of that. I mean, it's the World Tag League. It's it it's you know, it's the World Tag League. <laughs> <laughs> um, even like a team like for instance, Guns and Gallows, I wouldn't bring them in. You can do something special and uh, you know have a big moment, big surprise by debuting them with whatever angle or it is that you want to you know kind of utilize them for. Um, I don't think that, and also if you were going to bring them in, um, I would say maybe you start doing some mystery vignettes during the G1. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) And they haven't done that. And it would be terrible booking in my opinion, if they just got announced, you know, a week from now and they're like, Oh, they're back. This is the same company though, that has often, debut people and then had them in you know preview matches after a big return after an excursion as opposed to just bringing them in for the big surprise match like i for instance i'm a big fan of what they did with mox uh when he came in they gave a lot of surprises then they revealed it was him then he had the big money match they didn't have him have two or three tag matches leading up to the juice match um but last year when they brought Hiroma back, they had him doing preview matches leading up to the Tokyo Dome, which I wasn't a big fan of that, to be honest with you, Me, just you know, speaking personally. So anything's possible. But uh, back to the matter at hand, I, I don't really anticipate there being any crazy outside tag teams. Um, if, if you had to pick one outside tag team, that's not with new Japan or, you know, or basically one outside tag team. That's not God. Who's someone that you could see being brought in. Man, I'm trying to think, I think I'm just having a hard time even thinking of like, who's out there that would be worth them risking bringing into the country right now. I mean, I mean, good brothers are like the only team that are really like, I would say that outside team that they would bring in. That's one, the other one. And I, I don't know what the relationship is like in 2020 at this point, but, uh, you know, there's always Motor City Machine Guns. That's true. I know Saban is under Impact contract and is a producer for Impact. And now Shelly has, I think, been working a per-date deal. He just had actually an injury this weekend uh, during Bound for Glory, apparently a neck injury, and I had to cancel some of his indie booking. So not sure if he's going to be ready. But they do love those guys. They love Saban and they love Shelley. So I mean, well, I mean they when, might get they might get the uh the pass, you know. Wouldn't those guys be considered juniors though? It, it's World Tag League. <laughs> it don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> um as far as expectations for super juniors, I mean 
it would be so – I mean the big names that are out there that are part of this division, if they can come in, would be incredible. If we can get Robbie Eagles, if we can get ELP, if we can get Ryu Lee, uh, who else? I mean some guys on strong – you know, ACH is kind of back in the mix. I would love for them to find a way to get ACH over. TJP. Rocky Romero. The Amazing Red. Yeah. What, amazing Red would be incredible if they could bring him in. Um there's also like Michael Oku, mm, Rev Pro, from Rev Pro. He's the champion over there. That would that's someone um, that would definitely be you know kind of crazy. I don't think we see any um, luchadors from CMLL come in. No, yeah, the, the COVID situation in Mexico has been pretty crazy, um, and they, they've had a hard time kind of controlling that. There, a lot of wrestlers getting sick. I know Bandito. Was a guy who who got COVID, lost a lot of right. lot, a lot of weight for being sick, and so yeah, I don't know if any of the, the luchadors are gonna be able to make it over this time. And that's what I was gonna say. Like Bandito, is someone we kind of like hope and wait for. You know, when it, I don't even know if there's anyone else in, say, Ring of Honor that's like a junior. I mean, I guess Flip Gordon, but I, I'm not sure if there's anyone else that'd be worth bringing in. Yeah, maybe, maybe Hot Sauce Tracy Williams. Could, well, uh, there's always Jonathan. Yeah, Gresham. yeah, Gresham. Yeah. He will he be the pure champion by that point, hypothetically, if he wins it. So I know they're at the semifinals right now. So it's him. I think it's him and Hot Sauce, and then Gre- and then Lethal against somebody else. And so uh, that also could be detrimental, though, because I mean, if he is like a reigning champion for a title that they're just now trying to put over, he might not be too keen to come to New Japan do jobs. You know, right. So I mean, those are those are the guys that I look out for. Um, I, I, I at this point, I would just be happy if uh, you know we get really and ELP and you know um, what's his face Eagles. Yeah, and, and with Real Lee, I have seen a lot of you know Jim pictures from him and him you know saying he he misses you know New Japan stuff like that on Twitter. So. Maybe that's, that's, yeah. a little, that's a little tease. I'm not sure if he's been in Mexico this whole time or if he's been somewhere in the U.S., but, you know, maybe he can get over, and that that would be excellent. Well, anyways, uh, to finish out the rest of this card, we got Tomaki Hama and Golden Aces taking on Chase, Kenta, and Jay White on the f- in the fifth match of the night. Uh, the semi-main event will be Sonata and Tetsuya Naito taking on Ujiro Takahashi and Evil. Um, I guess the big question with this is seeing Naito and Sonata team night after night. That might be a little suspect. And also, are either of them going to take a pinfall, or are they just going to like run roughshod over these Bullet Club pairings with Evil? Well, I mean, Evil, he's been with Dick Togo. Now he's with Yujiro. He's been with all these pin eaters. So, yeah, it looks like they're, they're trying somehow to keep Sonata strong, since obviously he's not going to be on the main power struggle card, and there's nothing really set for him in the horizon here. Um, I can tell you the strongest way to keep him strong. What's that? You send him to strong. <laughs> <laughs> Let him be the champion of strong. They they should just do the Sonata Invitational, and he just comes out every week and whoops everybody's ass. <laughs> um, and then the main event of this evening will be the – oh, we got a question actually. I'm yeah, sorry. So, so I'm ready to – if I can be serious, which I'm hoping is, is you know, Lance Storm – you know, admitting that he, you know, he's a oh listener of keeping a strong style right now. Uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure if it's Lance, he probably loved my my rant about the magic pro wrestling. I know it. <laughs> uh, but he's asked, so what do you think will be in store for Sonata at Wrestle Kingdom? If history bears true, he'll be involved in some sort of title situation. Um, I think that. I think the whole thing with him t- teaming with Naito during this evil feud is a little suspect to me. I'm not saying he's going to turn necessarily, but uh, I just think it's a very interesting placement that they've got him tagging with the guy he beat. And they're fighting another guy that he also beat, but those guys are fighting over the titles and he's the third man out. Um, so who knows, you know, who really right. knows? I don't know. And with, but, uh, with two nights at the Dome, could it be that it's Naito Sonata one night and then the winner of that faces Ibushi the next night? What if we get Naito Sonata Evil triple threat match one night 
and then your traditional Ibushi title match the next night. I mean that that could happen, or you you, you do it with some other kind of double 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 gold dash where you have like Evil versus Sonata again, then Naito versus Abushi one night, and then the two winners face each other the next night. And then you could have a G one final rematch of like Abushi Sonata kind of thing. I don't know. I have no clue what Sonata will be doing to be honest with you, but uh, I assume he'll be involved in some sort of title situation of some sort, whether it's you know the British belt. U.S. belt, the never belt, I don't know, the I'm, white belt. I mean, him and Shingo could win World Tag League, and, and, and you have Shingo and Tanada oh, versus, that would suck. versus Techers. I, well, maybe against Techers, maybe, but that might, I feel like that's a huge step back for him. Yeah. You can't, you can't go from being the semi-main event or the, the you know, the, the runner-up in the G1 to, you know, the World Tag League winner. That's, t- Dave Finley won the World Tag League last year. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh But uh, speaking but, of the uh, tag titles That is our main event on this evening The champions Dangerous Techers In their second defense Will be defending against Yoshihashi And Hiroki Goto You know um, I didn't know I really wanted this match But we talked previously About how this division Was lacking challengers Lacking credible threats compelling matchups and we're like basically at this point we just have two you know two teams the aces and the techers and you know what else is out there well now we got yoshihashi and uh goto and things are kind of heated up so it's pretty awesome yeah i'm really looking forward to this match based off what we've been seeing from the you know six man stuff and just you know the role yoshihashi has been i think this could be another Kind of stand out, uh, you know, tag match here that we're seeing on these road to tours. And uh, if it goes as well as the six man, it could be another, you know, nominee for certain certain awards and just could see a lot of praise here. Yeah, uh, I'm very excited for this one. Um, what do we think the chances are that Yoshihashi uh, succeeds in his quest to add more gold to his resume and walks out as, you know, Yoshihashi Dose Belts? Hmm. I don't know. I know I, I'm digging Yoshihashi. I'm loving the fire that he he's has lately. But I just feel like I don't know if they're gonna double. They're ready to double strap this man yet. And so I think Dangerous Techers are gonna re- retain. Oh, one other thing. Did you hear Hiroki Goto's in in a movie? I think I did see something about that. Yeah. Do you know what Common Rider is? Common Common Rider isn't that kind of based off the uh, the Mask Rider series that was here in the U.S. Dude, I don't know what Common Rider is. Like to me, like it almost looks like Ramen Rider. So I just imagine like it has something to do with like Maruchin Top Ramen or some <laughs> shit like that. Like I don't know, what, I don't know what Common Rider is, but uh, I saw Goto is like a prominent role, or maybe a star in this Common Rider movie that's coming out. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, Goto got his hair uh, cut up real nice. Uh, I'm calling him Handsome Goto right now. <laughs> yeah. It's looking good. But, uh, yeah, I I think the Dangerous Techers are going to be retaining their belts. I think they're going to be going into the World Tag League as the champions, um, which might kind of suck because I was hoping – previously I was hoping Dangerous Techers would actually win World Tag League this year since they've been like the MVPs two years running. But um, this match has, like, you know, greatness written all over it. I mean, I'm not – I don't want to overhype it and say it's going to be, you know, match of the year contender, but three and three quarters, four stars, maybe more than that, somewhere in that range. It's probably going to be a really good road to main event. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good main event. And something else I wanted to mention that uh, Sabre said at the end of that main event when he was like, kind of jawjacking with Yoshihashi – uh, he was like, you know, your belt is never ours is IWGP. You will never hold an IWGP belt. It's like ne- <laughs> he's like never is dead, mate. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right, and so uh, next, uh, real quick, we'll talk about NJPW Strong. They had night two of their Never Tour. We had uh, Mr. No Days Off, Fred Rosser defeating Clark Connors. We had Carl Fredericks defeating ACH. We had the Gorillas of Destiny, Tamatonga and Tangloa defeating Brody King and Flip Gordon. And then in the main event, we had Switchblade Jay White defeating Rocky Romero. 
Did you get to check out uh, any of this uh, Never Action here, Josh? <sighs> yeah, I did, and I think I am going to never watch this show again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just playing. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this week I want to do the whole in-depth conversation about strong, but that day is coming where we have a very serious look as to what are they doing? Why are they doing this? Should they keep doing this? What does the future hold? Cause uh, right now th- the short story is, I don't think this is the way. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll, we can have another discussion about that, but yeah, kind of on the same wavelength. And we kind of talked about a little bit before kind of our opinion, the kind of the direction they've been going with strong, um, I really I did like the main event of uh, Jay and Rocky. I wish they would have had a crowd for that match. It was a very similar layout to the Rocky ELP match from Best of Super Juniors last year, with Rocky kind of working over the arm and getting all these kind of quick, you know, near falls and quick, almost near submission attempts on Jay White. That was a, a really good matchup. Definitely would have been enhanced um, in a Cork and Hall, you know, crowd that could cheer. Uh, yeah, I was just glad to see Jay White get some reps in before this uh, big match with the Bushi. So, good on him, you know? Yeah, you know, it's flying back over to, to do the <laughs> J- strong match. J- Jet setting. <laughs> <laughs> um, quick thoughts, though. Um, someone who's starting to come into his own a little bit and for whatever reason is kind of impressing me more than I anticipated, Fred Rosser. Um Kind of sucks Clark Connors won that tournament and got jobbed out to Fred Rosser the next week. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Carl Fredericks beat ACH, which I thought for a little six-minute match was very good. Um, surprised to see Fredericks pick up the win over, you know, longtime vet ACH. But I guess, you know, that old adage of, you know, Junior's going to job, that's starting to play out here too. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this, this whole this two-night never tour, all the juniors lost against the heavyweights. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like, these are dream matches you've never seen before. Never going to happen because it's juniors versus heavyweights. Only only on strong, and then all the juniors lost. <laughs> Every <laughs> single one of them. Um, and then, like you mentioned, the, the main event was the, the match of the night. Probably one of the better strong matches they've had, and... Uh, very similar to the ELP Rocky Romero story. Jay White wins. Rocky looked great. And, uh, yeah, we move on. Uh, next week is New Japan Showdown. Road to New Japan Showdown. Right. Not not the showdown yet. The road to the showdown. The road to showdown. Okay. <laughs> um, so not- Although the road to shows look identical to the actual shows. So right. It's, there's, there's no it's real. confusing. <laughs> Not a real big difference there. So, yeah, so yeah, the New Japan Showdown that will be the next theme for their tours. Not sure how many of those shows there will be, but, yeah, we'll keep you updated. There's no, as of this recording, no card or matches announced for that. So we'll see what happens coming this Friday. Uh, some quick uh, news items here. So we are going to have live English commentary for the Power Struggle show that's happening on November 7th. So that will be great. Um, the free. Are we, get, are we getting uh, the golden announcer, Don Callis? No, nah, no, we're, we're not. He, he, he's, <laughs> he's not crossing the line. You know, he, he's staying in impact right now. Uh, I believe he was on commentary for Bound for Glory. Um, oh, I don't. I don't watch that. <laughs> I, 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 I did not watch Bound. For, I did not watch Bound for Glory or Hell in the Cell this weekend. Um, oh, you didn't watch Hell in the Cell? I did not. No, I'm behind. Oh, well, I'm surprised. <laughs> Oh, wait, what were you doing last night that you weren't able to watch Hell in a Cell? Hey, we, we, we don't got to talk about that on air. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, other news. Uh, free match of the week, Minoru Suzuki versus uh, Toro Yano in the Bull Rope Death Match for the Never Openweight title from Power Struggle 2017. A uh, little interesting match up there in the whole Suzuki-Yano uh, rivalry. Yeah, fans of Suzuki style matches, check this out. Fans of Yano style matches, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and last thing here, there is going to be a uh, giant, b- giant Bob Memorial show. It's going to be happening on uh, February fourth at Corkin Hall. Uh, referee Koye Wada will be putting the show together, so New Japan will have some involvement in that. 
Is it February? I thought it was April 2nd. Uh, well, I, I got this from the Observer. Observer said 2-4, unless they had, they, that's, they had it backwards and it's supposed to be 4-2. Uh, well, let me see. Okay. It's probably February because he died on January 31st, so that would make the most sense if it, if it was a memorial. So, yeah, it probably will be February. Nice. Um, and then we have a um, few off-topic questions here that we punted from last week that we're going to uh, go through real quickly here. Um, so first, from uh, Viking Pain, you guys are known for answering the tough questions, and that's why a lot of us appreciate your podcast. You don't fear losing listeners with your takes regardless if it's controversial or not. But I'm afraid this next question will start a civil war of its own within the KISS community. So with that said... Put these five hunks in order <laughs> from one to five and rank them basically solely on their handsomeness, with number one being the most handsome between Kota Abushi, Kazuchika Okada, Hiroshi Tanahashi, Beardless Sonata, and young Minoru Suzuki. Oh my God, this is an impossible <laughs> task. See, it, it's one thing when you say Sonata or Suzuki, but when you throw out Beardless Sonata, and young Suzuki, I mean, all bets are off. I don't even know where to start. Yeah, this, this is a tough one. Um, um, so are, are we saying, so also we're, go, we're going. So Handsomeness. One is the highest or five. One is the highest. Okay, so first place, first to fifth place kind of thing here. Um, so, oh, man, is it, I think for me. Number one, I got to go with the ace, number one for me. Hiroshi Tanahashi is not the most handsome of these five guys. Are you kidding me? The, the hair, man. Have you? It doesn't matter about the hair. Sometimes his hair be on some fuck shit. Have you ever seen young Minoru Suzuki? He is the heartthrob of all heartthrobs. If that, if that man hadn't left to go fight in Pancrase, he would have held the IWGP title for t- like 15 <laughs> years straight. <laughs> All right, so you got Suzuki number one then? I got Suzuki number one. Okay. Uh, so who are you going for your for your number I, two? I got Tanahashi dead last on this thing. Oh, wow. Bro, Okada, Beardless, Sonata, and Ibushi are all hotter than Tanahashi. I don't know, man. It's the ace. <laughs> yeah, who cares if he's the ace? Like, <laughs> Uh, I, I'll take Abushi number two for me. Oh my god, no! I I can't even do a list with you at this point. We <laughs> he was absolutely right. Like we're, we're gonna have to do our own our own lists here. Well, like, so, well, we are doing our own lists. Like you got you. So you got Suzuki number one. Uh, I got I got Tanahashi then Abushi. Who do you got for your number two? Oh, uh, Okada, easy. Okay, uh, who who you got for your number three? Abushi. Then I'm gonna go Beerless Sonata. Then I'm gonna go Tanahashi. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, for my number three. I will go uh, Beerless Sonata. Then I'll go Young Suzuki. Then Okada last. Um, Okada <laughs> last. Oh, for handsomeness. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let us know, ladies and gentlemen. Send in, send in your your rankings of where you rank these guys one to five on handsomeness. Like, Jeremy, I think, like, you're judging these guys, like, based on, like, how they look coming out, like, for a match, you know, in full gear. I'm judging them based on how they look at, like, say, a G1 presser dressed to the nines, you know, mm. suited up, handsome. Yeah, I guess I, I am thinking about the, the, in, the entering attire presentation. Bro, you're, you're a body guy. <laughs> Fucking body guy on this show. <laughs> Put Okada last. You gotta be kidding me. He's like the most handsome man ever. Uh. Crazy. <laughs> All right, right. Tanahashi number one. This. Oh my god. Let, let's move on to the next this question. This is ridiculous. <laughs> From a highest fly flow. He says, "What nickname irks young boy more, Little K, Debbie Chan, or King Switch?" Who's Debbie Chan? That's what um, Juice calls um, Finley. <laughs> oh, and who's little? Little K, is that Little Kazu? No, that's Kenta. Because he's Little oh. Kenta. 
compared to Kenta Kabashi? Oh, I mean, I still... I think Lil' K and Debbie Chan could get on my nerves, but I haven't even heard them used enough to really bother me. Like that, I don't like King Switch. King Switch sounds stupid. Yeah, I'm. I, I would have to go with the King Switch, honestly, too. King Switch sounds like a a, a character on Mister Rogers play, <laughs> like, like uh, one of the puppets or some shit. Uh, next question from Stale Burger Bun: Ignoring language barriers and everything being shut due to COVID, which faction would be the best to hit the town with? Suzuki Gun would absolutely be the best people to hit the town with. I'm trying to think, yeah, probably. I think Chaos might be kind of fun. Like, I feel like Ishii would be like, you know, take you to the best like bar, the best bear spots. Uh, but overall, yeah, probably Suzuki Gun. You want to hang out with Chaos? I, I don't know, bro. We we live different <laughs> lives. <laughs> <laughs> Next question from William He says be honest How much candy would it take for either of you To dress up as Yujiro For Halloween Oh I mean It wouldn't take that much candy at all Like I I considered this as a very real possibility For this Halloween season So, Well I, I feel like you could pull it off Better than I can Yeah So I mean I I was gonna be Yujiro, and she was gonna be Peter. <laughs> great, great, great little uh, couple costume there. Uh, but ne- then, but then we were like, we'd rather do Tai Chi and Miho, Miho. <laughs> but I couldn't find rip away pants that worked. You know, mm. I couldn't, I couldn't find undersized uh, tights that with the right engravings either. So, dang, yeah, yeah maybe they'll make some um, Tai Chi underwear. They should uh, market a Tai Chi wig with like, because his hair is so crazy. Mm. I would wear the, I wear that wig for sure. You can get the wig, the mask, uh, sell, sell a tearaway pants. Oh, he, they do sell his tearaway pants, don't they? Do they? Yeah, remember they were selling that. Remember that weird video with Chris Charlton? Oh, yeah, that's and a- right. Yes, <laughs> yes, right. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I forgot that, about that. That video with Chris Charlton ripping his pants off is like one of the most like. <laughs> unsettling videos especially like the vi- like they shot it with like his phone like from a low angle and it's in a dark room he's like in a corner like it was giving me like Blair Witch feels <laughs> like it was very weird uh, next question here from at Buckeye Tiffin what's the worst submission hole that stupid butterfly lock or the money clip I, I I would normally say butterfly lock, but he's at least been incorporating a double wrist lock into it, and it's been getting a, that's made it a little better actually. But the money clip hasn't. I mean, the money clip sucks. Ah, oh, they both suck. But if you if you have to pick one, which which one? Do I, you? Well, I say the money clip because it's actively bringing down one of the greatest performers in the history of professional wrestling. So. Yeah, I bet you Okada could get. A, well, I don't know. I used to think Okada could do a lot of things, but he couldn't get this money clip over. So I don't know if he could get over that. Uh, you know the what's it called? Butterfly lock. Yeah, butterfly lock. It's not even really a butterfly lock. That's that's the thing I hate about it. It's not even actually a butterfly lock. Right. That. Yeah. It's. But at least like you mentioned, he's incorporating the Kimura now to it and kind of transitioning some other holes into it. So he he's actually progressing, making it better. Yeah. Uh, next question here from our user Raising Falcons. Concerning Suzuki Goon, if someone has to take over as leader, who would you prefer, Tai Chi or Zach? Uh, at this point, Tai Chi. Yeah, I think it's based on just how everything is set up and Zugan always kind of being kind of a, a Japanese-led faction. I, I think it makes more sense for Tai Chi to lead and just just his his booking and the progression of how he's progressed over the years, I think I would prefer Tai Chi as well. Uh, next question here from Reddit user ATTI1XBOY. Uh, first he asks, uh, why does it feel like booking has gone downhill recently? And similar. Similarly, why is NJBW so unwilling to use special match types for matches of continuing feuds of matchups we have seen earlier in the year? Has the booking gone downhill recently? I mean, um, 
I don't think it has. I mean, we just saw literally one of the greatest booked G1s in the history of the G1 Climax Tournament. Um. <laughs> I mean, also, there, there's some questionable booking a, a, around the IWGP title. Okay, okay, you're getting a fourth Naito Evil match. All right, yeah, I don't want to see it either. I get it. Um, but at the same time, you had to know this was coming because the guy that beats the champion in a prominent spot like the way Evil did in the tournament always gets a title shot. The other thing, too, is they usually get that title shot as a placeholder before we go to Wrestle Kingdom. You know what the good news here is? Yeah, it's a little bit predictable, but the good news is Evil's not going to win. And then he's not going to be anywhere near the title picture for all of Wrestle Kingdom. And on top of that, he's probably not going to get anywhere near that title picture again until, like, I don't know. Two years from now? You Realistically? Think, you think so? He's not winning a New Japan Cup again, I don't think. I mean, he, he could win a G1, but I mean, what are the chances he picks up another title between now and next Wrestle Kingdom? It seems unlikely, doesn't it? Yeah, but I feel like he might ch- at least challenge at some point throughout the year. He might get one title shot at, like, a Destruction Tour or, you know, uh, Don Taku. Right. but. That's about it. Like, we're not going to have to see him carry the straps again. Right. Hopefully. (laughs) If anything, he might carry the white belt. Like, it's going to be a while before we really actually see him carry the title again, which is kind of nice, you know? Yeah. And speaking of – go ahead. Well, I just like to – I think that you you, you should also address this. Like, I – maybe you think the booking has gone downhill. I can't speak for you, Jeremy, but, like, I can't even – Think about the fact that we went through a COVID era. They were off for like three and a half months. Most of the talent wasn't in the country. Uh, I think this company's been booked immaculately. They made stars out of Doki. They made a star out of Yoshi. Hashi. <laughs> 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 like, um, there are more good stories than bad stories going on in New Japan. Like, they've raised the stock of a lot of people. The one and you know what? Say what you will about the evil experiment. They at least made him seem prominent enough to be given this opportunity. And some people actually are really into it. I'm not one of them. I don't think Jeremy is, but there are people who buy him as a main event level talent now, which he wasn't seen as before, you know? Yeah, and I agree with you. And, you know, when the whole evil stuff started, and I, I kind of my kind of point was like, yes, I was not happy what was going on with the you know, the IWGP title booking, but I liked everything else that was going on. I I liked the Dangerous Techers Golden Ace feud. I liked the Hiromu Taiji Ishimori feud. Hiromu getting a big shot in the Japan Cup wrestling heavyweights. Um, I liked the Never situation with with Shingo and Suzuki rivaling. You know, we we had the Shingo Show rivalry before that. We had. Uh, Nagata and Suzuki uh, having rivalries. We've had the de- debut of Master Wato. Um, and he, he was kind of good at the beginning of his debut. Uh, and so there's just a lot of different stories and angles that, that I liked outside of the main event picture. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of really great stories this year, like Shingo's run with the Never title, him giving opportunities to all these juniors. That's right, I mean, yeah, the Desperado match. The uh, Who else did he defend against? Um, there one, one, show? Yeah, show, yeah. Uh, Golden Aces versus Dangerous Techers was, like, one of the best tag team feuds uh, in a very, very long time. Like, I, I don't see it, man. I, I just don't, you know. This is a company that was first not running and then after they started running they were in completely empty arenas and then they were in like you know quarter capacity arenas like they've had a lot to kind of go against and this is probably the most cohesively booked company of any in the world including aw including whatever other company you want to name um yeah the booking hasn't gone downhill (laughs) <laughs> the one thing you could really point to is like Oka- Okada is not as hot as he normally feels and he's been in some weird situations and uh, you know, they, they pushed evil and may- maybe you're not into that. But other than that, like I don't see what else. Oh, and also they don't have the elite here anymore. 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's been the case for almost two years. What, a year or two years now? Yeah. So I, I don't see what – I don't see it, man. Uh, his second question was uh, the question we've been getting a lot. When and how do you think they will separate the two belts? Oh, actually, he, there's another part to his question I want to address. So he asked, why is this company so unwilling to use special match types for continuing feuds? Um, New Japan has never been a company that utilized gimmicks to further feuds unless the story of the match called for it. This is actually the thing that we complained about when they introduced the KOPW title because it's so rare and special when they even do a gimmick match that the idea of the KOPW title and the gimmicks that they were proposing was preposterous. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, I mean, I don't think they've been unwilling. I mean, unwilling would basically, the, the only way that you could say they're unwilling is if like, Someone was like, hey, guys, are you willing to do a cage match for this evil Naito feud? And they go, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that was never on the table, you know? Right. Like, it, that was never part of the story that they were telling. Uh, do I think it could help? Maybe if they did, like, say, a no DQ match for that match? Sure. But uh, I'm not the booker. But I'm not expecting it. And anyone who watches this this product shouldn't expect it because – we haven't been taught or conditioned to believe that we're getting anything like that because it never happens, hardly ever. Exactly, yeah. If you've been watching New Japan for any length of time now, you know you just don't get giving matches, except with KOPW is kind of thrown out there. So, Remember we got like the Texas Death Match at Wrestle Kingdom last year? We were like, what is this going to be? Right, we had no idea like, how to lay out the rules, like what, were they, <laughs> what they were going to do. Uh as far as separating the two belts, um, I, I don't think they're either going to do it at Wrestle Kingdom or they're not going to do it until after Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah, at, at this point, yeah, kind of we're on the road to Wrestle Kingdom right now. I don't – also, it's not happening at Power Struggle, the, the double title match. So, And then we have World Tag League with Super Junior. So, it, it's yeah, like you said, it's got to be at Wrestle Kingdom or in the aftermath. And who knows? Maybe they don't separate them at all. Maybe they it's become the double crown title. I think that they need a what I they need a secondary singles belt. I feel based on this past year, I feel pretty strongly they need something, you know, a tag team title would be great, but you need a tag division for that to really work. Um I think that the the white belt needs to I don't here's a few things I think they don't need. I don't think they necessarily need that never title. And I don't think they necessarily need the U.S. belt, but I think they need the IC belt given, you know, the level prestige that's behind it. I think it's uh, once they start doing more of the live touring, which is already starting to kick up now and things ramp up, I think they're going to need it back. Yeah, probably. Uh, next question here from Radizer Dom Homie 101 Non wrestling question What are the young boys thoughts on the Lopez Versus Lomachenko fight Who is next for both fighters will we see a rematch And what type of impact will this fight Have on the boxing world going forward uh, Great question So um, Yeah man Tiafomo is for real uh, For those of you that don't know Um Lomachenko is seen as being like amongst one of the like top two or three best fighters in the world. Many people would have said he was the best fighter in the world, at least the the most skilled boxer. Um, and he got outboxed by T- uh, this young kid, Tiafomo Lopez. Um, part of the issue, and I'll just keep it brief, I think Lomachenko has always been a little bit too small for lightweight. And he's gone up, you know, he's been at this weight class for a while, but we've seen him run into trouble on at least two specific instances at this weight. And I don't think it's his optimum weight. I think he's an undersized guy who is just so skilled that he's been going through, you know, some incredible champions. But Lopez, you know, was able to outgame him on that night. Both those guys are so, so, so good. Um, I think we might get a rematch. Um, as far as what's going to happen going forward, I mean, Lopez unified the entire division. He's got all the belts. That's very rare in the sport of boxing. So, um, I don't know how many people saw it. I know it was, uh, on ESPN for free. Um, 
I think it might hurt Lomachenko a little bit just because of his aura of invincibility has kind of been, you know, taken away a little bit. Um, great champions when they lose, usually come back and win those titles back. And so I think that that's probably what's next for him, but I, I would like to see him go down, um, to a smaller weight class, you know, um, maybe like super featherweight back to featherweight. I don't know. Nice. Uh, next question here from Maserati says, why does Josh insist on being selfish and only wrestling the way he wants to wrestle? Not the way everyone else wants him to wrestle. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've been in a group chat and friends of ours keep us suggesting different things that I should do in wrestling. And uh, I've just been telling them all, like, leave me alone because <laughs> this shit's hard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Next question from Highest Fly Flow. What are your favorite matches featuring outsiders? I recently watched Tayo Kea versus Tanahashi from one of the first Wrestle Kingdoms where they had New Japan and All Japan collaborate. And Marifuji versus uh, Okada from King of Pro Wrestling 2016. Hmm, that's a great question. Um, Marifuji versus Okada is really, really, really good. Um, I also, their G1 match from that same year is really great. Um, this is a tough question. Yeah. I mean, I like, you know, speaking of Mary Fuji, I like the Mary Fuji Devitt matches. Um, some good series of matches there. Um, they recommended match of the week, um, about a month or so ago that, um, the Steiner brothers against, well, I guess the, the two outsiders against each other, I guess, Steiner's against, uh, Big Bad and, um, Dangerous. Well, when he says outsider, I think he's talking about people that are not seen as being like New Japan talents specifically. So, like, he talked about like Tai Okea coming in and he talked about like Marifuji from Noah, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Uh, um, I'm trying, honestly, like, my mind is like blanking in this moment. <laughs> <laughs> um,. I really like the 94 um, Super Junior Finals where it's uh, Super Delphin against uh, Liger. Uh, yeah. That one's really, really, really good. Yeah, we reviewed that match in our final countdown series. So if you guys haven't checked that out on this, uh, the, the feed here, we did that during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, also... There's another Super Juniors match that I really liked. It was Koji Kenemoto against uh, Dr. Wagner. Yes, my, my man Koji Kenemoto. From 97. That one's really great. Um, I don't know. Inoki Vader in the Dome when Vader uh, wasn't... I mean, Vader had a history here, but that's from 96. He wasn't really with the company anymore. Um, that one's great. Jericho versus Omega. I mean, Jericho was coming into the company, but he was pretty much an outsider. Uh, Kenta Kobashi against Masahiro Chono, uh, just to see like Kenta just throw Chono around. <laughs> I don't know, man. I can't think of any tonight. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a lot of great suggestions. And so, you know, this question was asked in our discord. So you guys can kind of jump in our discord and kind of throw around some, you know, matches that you guys like of outsiders. And I know there's a lot of like stuff like on, you know, the wire and stuff like that on New Japan's YouTube, where they kind of go through some of the top outsiders and outsider matches like that. So, Oh, uh, you know, I, um, actually I do have one. Um, I'm trying to remember what this match is. You know, most people wouldn't even really like it, to be honest with you. But uh, let me take a look here and see. Go on without me for a second. I'll, I'll have the match here in just a second. All right. So now we have the recommended match. of. The I week. got it. Got it? <laughs> the first strong Kobayashi versus Antonio Inoki match. Uh, I want to say it's like 74. Four, maybe 75 um that was that's probably my favorite like outsider match personally um even though kobayashi was coming into the company like strong kobayashi was the ace of iwe and he had just recently defected and was coming in and uh new japan 
and also just in general, like per Rezu didn't really do domestic stars against one another hardly ever. And this was like a huge dream match to have the ace of IWE come in and fight the ace of New Japan. And uh, I, I love that match. I, it's 70s style. A lot of people wouldn't dig it. I, I would never make Jeremy sit through it as like the recommended <laughs> match of the week. But uh, if you got, it's on New Japan World, and if you got time to watch it, it's the first match they had. I, I love that match. Would you consider uh, Will Ospreay versus Amazing Red, with Red being an outsider for that tournament at the beginning? Not really, maybe. Um, but I was thinking, uh, you know, there's always like UWF against New Japan as well, obviously. Now I'm starting to think about it. So, I mean, you got like, you know, obviously the, um, God, what's, who's, who's the guy from UWFI? Which, which guy? He was their champion, Takata. It's like the Takata Muto matches, the Takata uh, Hashimoto match, which are all, you know, famous Tokyo matches. Pretty great. Nice. Well, now for the uh, recommended match of the week. So last week you recommended the 2001 G1 finals between Yuji Nagata and Kiji Muto. Um, this was a awesome matchup. Um, started off a uh, slow Doing some chain, dress, chain wrestling, some exchange into submissions and kind of some MMA uh, type of grappling here. Uh, you know, Muto moves in uh, to actually, actually, it was Nagata. He got a guillotine on Muto. And I don't know what um, Tiger Tor was looking at. To me, Muto, Muto tapped out on this guillotine. <laughs> he was clearly smacking his hand up and down on the map. My man, Blue Justice, had this match won way earlier. Uh, in this contest, but they continue the match up here. Uh, got, both men are kind of working on the legs throughout this match. You know, Muto's getting huge pops off of everything he does. He does his, um, you know, kick to the knee, does his uh, rushing elbow, his signature elbow, a drop thing there. Crowd goes wild. Uh, Nagata's um, fighting out of leg bars and arm bars. Uh, Muto went for his handspring elbow. Uh, Nagata rushes into a Nagata lock. We have Muto continuing to work on the legs with dragon screws, uh, you know, a chop. Drop, drop kick to the, the leg. Um, Nagata's kind of fighting out of that, working triangles, uh, throwing strikes. Muto's coming back with uh, his shining wizards. Uh, once again, targeting the leg, dragging screw to figure four. Like I mentioned, crowd just popping huge for everything uh, Muto was doing. Um, eventually, Nagata comes back uh, for leg trap ankle lock. He's working the leg over. Um, both guys kind of have this like spinning uh, wheel kick exchange. Muto hits a Frankensteiner, a moonsault from near falls. Um, Muto misses a kick, and Nagata hits him with a big German and exploder. M- Muto no sells, fighting spirits, a shining wizard. Um, great finish here. That's when the, the rolling kick kind of combo exchange happens, and then Nagata eventually uh, gets him, and it's a mission here to get the win. Yeah, really. Uh, I love this match. It's Nagata's fourth and final, or I'm sorry, Muto's fourth and final um, appearance in a G1 final. Um, at the time, the, the the wrestling world was, you know, in a time of huge upheaval. You know, pro wrestling Noah had just formed not too long prior to this, and so all Japan and New Japan were in the middle of a cross promotional angle. So at the time of this match. Uh, Kiji Muto is in the middle of a resurgence, his career, like, I don't know if you guys remember, but like Kiji Muto in WCW in 2000 as the great Muda, like balding, he looked terrible <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't looking so hot in WCW or in, in New Japan in, in, at the same time. But by 2001, man shaved his head, got a new gimmick, changed everything around, wrestled a new style. He, he changed with the times. And he went into this match as the Triple Crown heavyweight champion, which was, like, unheard of, you know. Um, so the crowd was really behind this. And this is Nagata's first G1 Finals appearance. So, you know, he, with the fact that he was kind of being coronated the ace, not specifically in this match, but just in general, sort of a really important changing of the guard type match. You know, you've got the big star in Kijimuto. He's not long for New Japan at this point. And, Nagato is kind of going to uh, carry them through the quote unquote dark ages. And this match, it's weird in a sense because it's like 
you could say it's ahead of its time with the way that like MMA was kind of going to be incorporated into pro wrestling. But then at the same time, it's, this is strong style. This is what Inoki's vision of what strong style actually was, you know, a very realistic battle of pro wrestling. And that's what these guys were doing. And they're obviously borrowing quite a bit from the shoot world as, as well. But how, how the crowd just bites on almost every single submission shows the importance of the match, you know, and, Sometimes nowadays fans, we, we only mark out, it seems like, for the impact moves, you know, because we've been conditioned to, to know that that's when a finish is coming. But these fans were taught that a submission, especially with like MMA, could lead to a finish at any point. So like every time someone's in the sub, they start freaking out. And it, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, real awesome match. I'm like uh, four and a quarter on it. Definitely a great uh, recommend here for the, for the week. And now uh, it's my turn for the uh, recommended match. And, you know, I know it was my turn, and this is having to catch my eye. I know our friends over at Voices of Wrestling have, I'm kind, of, shocked. <laughs> have kind of been <laughs> shocked. have been going back in the archive and pouring some stuff out. And one match that they, they tweeted about when we were talking about was this match up here, and it kind of caught my eye. I'm like, you know, screw it. We're, we're getting ready for World Tag League season. This is a tag match that happened in November 3rd of 1986, it is Antonio Inoki and Kevin Von Erich versus Kingo Kimura and Kiji Muto. So, I have not seen the match yet, but I've heard <laughs> great things about it. And so, we're, we're all going to watch along together and, and figure out how, how good this match was. Dude, I've never, I don't even, I didn't <laughs> know this match existed. <laughs> I think this might be one of the first times you've recommended something that I've never seen. <laughs> uh, I I don't know what to expect from Kevin Von Erich in New Japan teaming with Inoki, so uh, it'll be interesting. <laughs> uh, since you mentioned, it's funny because Tag League's going to be coming up, but so is Super Juniors. I almost feel like this Super Juniors isn't real, though. Right, it's... it's uh... Like, we're at the end of the year. I know what that means. My body's telling me it's World Tag League season. It's, Super Juniors is a summer thing. This is just some weird, you know, ju- junior-like tournament that well, just happens to be happening during World Tag League. It's a Super J-Cup. <laughs> like, this is, to me, the winter months are Tag League. I don't care that a Super Juniors is happening at the same time. It's Tag League. That's what's happening. I I have to tell myself that, otherwise it's gonna be hard for me to get through it. I have to prepare <laughs> myself. <laughs> well, get ready because it's gonna be coming hot and heavy pretty soon. But uh, yeah, that's that's it. That's the recommended match of the week, and that's gonna wrap things up for this week. Uh, next week we'll be back to review uh, this weekend's Road to Power Struggle shows and give our predictions for uh, the main Power Struggle show coming up on November seventh. So if you enjoyed today's show, please consider making a donation by visiting socialsuplex.com slash donate. Clicking on that donate button under the Keeping It Strong Style logo. Make sure you connect with us on social media. The show is at KI Strong Style. You can also follow us at Social Suplex. You can follow me at Jeremy L. Donovan. On Facebook, we are facebook.com slash social suplex. Also, find the Wrestling Squared Circle Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash wrestling squared circle. On Instagram, we are at social suplex. On Reddit, I'm the pro black guy. Y'all just keeping it strong style. You can email me, Jeremy, at social suplex.com. Check out all of our other shows here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. On Sundays, we have Bunch of Radio, hosted by Rich Ladder and James Floyd. On Wednesdays, we have the Ricky and Clyde Wrestling Show from Scotland. Every other Wednesday, we have grown men and watch this shit. On Thursdays, we have grave consequences. On Fridays, we have the 8-Bit Suplex. On Saturdays, we have all things elite. So don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review. And we will catch you next week on Keeping It Strong Style, the ace of podcasts. I think we did like a two-hour episode. It might might be less than that. Thank you for listening to Keeping It Strong Style. We'll see you next time.